remembering you have a common person, you have a common purpose, um, parents and guardians and, and school staff are all there for one purpose, one purpose for a meaningful educational program for, for the child. Um, letting everyone know you that, that you have a voice, um, that you are your child's advocate. Um, you are a good listener, but you also have a good voice. And, um, you know, assuming good attentions from everyone, assuming that your, your team is there as a partner. Um, so going into the meeting with positive energy and assuming that everybody's there um, to work together and value the team and the members, trusting the process, um, practicing effective listening skills as well. Um, so those are some really good key points to remember when you go into this IEP and um, and and to not feel like um, you don't have a voice and that you need to be a part of this. Um, it, it's really important that you um, you start out understanding that 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 part of the process. Um, the next thing I want to address are health issues, making sure that you have a good health care plan, uh, whether that's um, some information for sleep or seizure or any other um, information that might be needed. Um, in that plan, it might be nice for you to have your provider's information, outside therapist's information, um, things like that, anything that you feel that the school um, might need to support your child. Um, the next thing I wanna share is uh, being prepared. So going into your IEP, um, you wanna be prepared. Um, there's a section of the IEP called the parent input. And I, I find that this section is one of the most important sections. Um, it kind of drives the IEP. So I had a meeting actually this morning with a mom and um, we talked about having her write her own narrative and then sending it to the school and they will put it into that section. Um, what do you want for your child? What are your goals? You know, friendships, relationships, what do you see at home? So that section, you can drive it, you can write it, you can um, you can create that section so that you have some some ownership in that in that piece. Um, let's see, uh, requesting an IEP draft. Now, typically most schools, this is uh, best practice. Um, I would say regardless, if your school says that they'll always give you a draft a few days before, I would still put that in writing. I would put that in the IEP that you would like, for example, to have the draft at least 72 hours in advance. Um, if you need your, your IEP or the, and the draft to be translated into another language, that is a request that you can get and should be documented as well into the IEP. Um, a lot of times some schools might say they can't do that, um, but by law, they, they need to do it. Um, so um, IEPs are to be designed as a family-friendly um, document, making sure there's enough time at the meeting. If you need to extend the time, then you plan the time at the end of the meeting to um, for another date. Um, don't feel like you need to be rushed. Don't feel like you need to just end the IEP. You can continue the IEP um, until you're comfortable. Um, again, making sure parents must be heard and you're contributing in a meaningful in a meaningful way, being involved. Um, Parents should not feel intimidated in the meeting. Share your personal feelings. Share how you, share your emotions. Um, I think that there's something about that empathy that really um, resonates with um, a good collaborative uh, team. Um, confirm with the IEP team if you need an interpreter prior to the meeting. Um, and you know it's important for for families to feel welcome at the school and part of the school community. Um, that might be something you might write in the parent input that you want to be part of the the school community. You want to be part of PTO. You want to be part of extracurricular. Um, 
You want your child to have peer relationships. You want to be a part of friendships within the community as well. So I think, you know, it's not only your child getting the appropriate support, but the total community experience. Um, so just a few other things, the safeguards packet. So um, I don't know, this is kind of small, so I don't know if everybody can read this, but um, it does say uh, for the first bullet, read the fine print. The, the team will give you that, that big packet, the safeguards uh, parent rights packet. You'll want to take it home. You'll want to read through it. Um, there are a lot of rights that parents have. You can call a special request IEP meeting um, as many times as you want. You do not have to have a meeting once a year. If you're needing to discuss or, or, or open the IEP and have an addendum, you can call for a special request IEP. So it's really important that you read that parent um, packet. And if you have any questions, ask for clarification. If you would like the team to go over the packet, you can set up a meeting and just go over that parent's packet. Um, the meeting, find out who's going to be in attendance prior to the IEP. Um, outside therapists, you could absolutely invite your outside therapists. Um, outside support resources are very important as well. Um, the importance of private therapies and school therapists to collaborate and have open communication, supporting each other's goals, um, accommodations and modifications. Um, the school team must accommodate the needs and address and address the needs um, within the IEP. Um, if you feel like uh, you want to add to that, then you need to um, ask for a meeting to um, to support more accommodations. Um, maybe it it might be some uh, technical accommodations. Maybe it is an environment accommodation. Um, maybe it's um, an actual like desk or or um, other sensory needs. Um, let's see. Uh, and then I would just, you know, uh, make sure that your, your, your child is getting enough, you know, breaks during the day, supervision, um, visual schedules, um, is there a plan for extra noise, uh, fire alarms, um, lockdown drills, cafeteria, things like that, um, that might, um, need extra support within the school day. Um, let's see, I think. Um, other information for IEP, um, an FBA, the functional behavior analysis, that data will create that behavior intervention plan. So if, um, if you already have a plan in place, but you feel like it needs some tweaking, then again, call for a meeting and ask them to, um, to start doing a new FBA, a new functional behavior analysis to help support a new behavior. Um, and sometimes the behavior plans, um, sometimes you have to fade away from some of the strategies and tools that are written into the behavior plan and um, think of some other strategies that um, might work. So um, that is something that can be tweaked throughout the year. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a document that should be um, continuously um, open if, if need be. Um, least restricted environment. Um, how often is your child receiving general education support um, with their same age peers? Um, how often do they access that general education environment? And uh, again, that outside therapists, um, some districts will allow here in Colorado, there's some districts that are allowing ABA therapists to um, come into the school and work within the, um, the school um, to help support. Um, every district and, and state is a little different. Um, and then just overall, 
Um, I know I kind of talked pretty quickly on this because because I want to get to some questions. Um, again, parent involvement with your school. I think that positive partnership with the school team and the school community is paramount. Um, if there is a difference of opinion or conflict, families and schools are more willing to discuss issues effectively if the IEP team has established early positive communication. Um, so that is really the biggest thing is to start from day one, some good rapport. Um, teacher morale improves when families are involved and can appreciate each other's challenges. Parents are experts in their child's diagnosis and needs. The school team has expertise in their profession. However, mutual collaboration will support best outcomes for the student. So that is kind of a little summary of um, kind of a back to school thoughts, tips um, to kind of think about. Does anyone have any questions to share or um, an IEP coming up that you would like to, um, to ask a question? I have a couple of questions in the chat. So Stacy, we all know that we probably once in our journey will deal with some sort of challenging IEP meeting or challenging, you know, team member or whatever. But so do you have any helpful tips on how to handle and navigate those situations? How do you hand how do you handle challenging IEP meetings and challenging districts? Um yeah, well. It, it's it, it's different for every every situation. Um, number one, I would go back to um, what's written into the IEP first of all. So um, if you have something written to the IEP and uh, the school is not following, they're out of compliance, and then that conversation is needs to happen right away. Okay, and um, if you are requesting for, for example, a para or some extra support and they say they don't have the funding or they say they don't have the data to support that need, um, you know, then you, you, you just, you, you keep going back and you having discussions. And I would, I would just um, absolutely um, call for a meeting. I would, uh, suggest the administration be involved. I, I'm assuming when you say challenging districts, the special ed coordinator. Um, I would kind of need more of an example on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like specific example. Um, because I, I've had many situations where we've had, I've had to go to mediation or once, you know, I did go to due process. Um, but I do think the majority of my meetings over the many years I've been doing this um, can be resolved with um, just back to the table conversations. At the end of the day, the school needs to, they need to take care of your child and they need to educate your child. And you just kind of have to keep going back to that, you know, questioning, do you feel like you're educating my child? You know, um, I think that's kind of, I mean, I would need a little more. Yeah. You know, so along you know. those lines a little bit, because I think as parents, we often worry that, or at least I know I do as a parent, but also I've heard from other parents that if you challenge, you know, someone on the team, or if you come across as this like mama bear, or you, you start off in a way that seem that other people view as being confrontational or whatever, because just you, what you're doing is advocating. Like, I guess the, the worry is, is that if you are working with these teams long-term, like is, have you seen situations to where his start off really shaky yeah. and aggressive that yeah. turn out to be good, right? Yeah. And I, I would be very blunt and I would preface by saying, I, I, you may perceive me as this mama bear. You may perceive me as, you know, overwhelming, but at the end of the day, I'm sure you can appreciate that I'm here to advocate for my child. Yeah. And how am I doing that? So, you know, you just kind of call them out on what you think that they're, they're thinking. Right. And then from there, that's kind of said, and then, and then if, you know, we have to come to some sort of agreement. Um, I mean, 
I've had I've had families that have had to switch districts and um, we've had challenges and um, you know and 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 IEPs were out of compliance. Um, you know, um, a family yesterday had a, a mom asked me yesterday if she should move, like literally move yeah. to another district. And, you know, I can't, I, I mean, I can't, I'm not comfortable telling someone to uproot themselves, like, yeah. you know, move their home and, and, you know, but, um, but it's the reality a lot of our families face, right? Like that we are, we, we it's, do it's up and move, you know, right? um, yeah. Which can be, um, I mean, I know that my you know, family, a, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. I was just say, I mean, I know our family ended up moving a whole into a whole other area in a district just because we were, you know, making sure that we had the best, the best school system that we thought for Jackson. So it's definitely a reality of a lot of our, our families face. And I think that, you know. I think all of us want to go into these meetings being successful, but there's always that fear because typically we're always in some sort of advocating, sometimes fighting mode to get the services for our kids. So it's nice to know that you've seen some of those situations turn around for the positive. Oh, oh, definitely. Um, and I will say it's social media is great, but what you might read and what your friend in another state is going through might not be what you're going to go through. Yeah. They may be struggling with funding, allocating paraprofessionals when, you know, it, your, a para was given to you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, this question, how can we be most prepared? Kind of like what I was saying in some of these um, PowerPoints, um, just knowing your rights, really like prefacing when you go in that you want to be a partner and that you want your child to be successful and that you want to be part of this community and how can you you know do, you know volunteer and be a part of that school and I think the more you show your face not once or twice for an IEP meeting there is something about that mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day you want your child to have social relationships too in the school so the more you can be a part of that, I, I do think makes a huge difference. Yeah. Um, what do we do if we disagree with an IEP? Um, again, you need to call for a special request IEP. You need to, we need to see if what is documented is out of compliance. Um, and one of the things I always tell families to ask for the data, um, accountability, do they have data on X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. Do, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and ask for it. Um, another thing that is helpful to kind of alleviate the potential of, you know, a negative experience, um, having that daily communication, mm -hmm. whether that is the, you know, old school back and forth notebook. I personally think a Google doc is fantastic. So it's just an easy thing single point of entry, everybody can log on. Um, I would document in the IEP that you want this daily communication and that your expectation is for everybody to communicate, not just the para writing in there, not just the special ed teacher. You want the speech therapist. If the speech therapist works with your child twice a week, you want to know what they're working on. Mm -hmm. um, the OT, it takes, you know, minutes to, to just write something in or just log on a Google doc. Um, and it's a win-win, right? Like, so yeah. you're, you're, yeah. you, your child comes home from school and now you have an understanding of what they did today and you can kind of work on that at home as well. Um, so, you know, that partnership. So, you know, at first some schools might say, well, we do a different kind of communication. You know, we do it once a week or something like that. Well, you know, this is a win-win. You tell them, you know, because I want to model what you're doing at home. Yeah, you know, I want to I want to partner with what you're doing at home. Um, difference between mainstreaming and inclusion. I think those are just for me, just two different words. Um, yeah. You know, um, uh, the least restrictive environment is is what we look at in the IEP, um, and how how many what is the percentage the student is in um, Gen Ed now. What I what I have a hard time with personally um, in the IEP, it may say something like 
the 40 to 79 percent with ge in general education. Now, 49 to or 40 to 79 percent is a huge range. So what I like to do is calculate the minutes, calculate that actual percentage. And in the prior written notice, we actually write the percentage this student is in the gen ed. And the reason why I do that is because if for some day, if for some reason there's a substitute mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. they're having like this, the, I guess um, maybe they're having some fourth grade testing or, or something like that, um, or in the middle school, they're doing some testing. Well, if they see on the IEP, it says 40 to 79%. And typically the, the, the student with specials and all that is usually in maybe 63% of the day. If they see that something's going on, but it's easier for them to be in their self-contained classroom, they'll go down to that 40%, which I, you know, I don't think is right. So I think that specificity of what that percentage is should be documented, not just that range, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And so um, we have a couple of questions that have come through the Q&A. One, one of the questions is um, about, you know, the service that you provide for the ASF through the amazing Colorado Children's Team. Um, that you do, that are you willing to review a final IEP for some of our parents as far as, uh, as oh, yeah. uh, with that consultation? Absolutely. I do that all the time. Perfect. And so I think, just I, so, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, not only will I review, um, I can virtually get on the IEP as well. Um, you know, you, um, the parent, will invite me, will tell the school who I am, and um, and I will log on and virtually be a part of uh, the IEP meeting if needed. Now, I will I will say, just so just to give some uh, examples to everyone who is listening right now, but will listen later, um, you know, the first experience I had with Stacy was actually at our family conference. She had been working and doing this for a while, obviously, with Dr. Dewis and the team, but at the family conference, we had a family that was actually having an IEP meeting, and it was a really challenging IEP meeting. And Stacy literally stepped away and sat in that IEP meeting with them. And I think you've still been a part of that journey yeah. with that family. Yeah. And so I think that's one thing a lot of families don't know that the, that the service is, is available through the ASF, through you, that you can do that one-on-one, -on -one, review it, but also be in the meeting as, a, as an advocate for, uh, you know, for us as caregivers, which is amazing. Yeah. And also like from the, from the, Children's Hospital, our multidisciplinary clinic, from that perspective, what's really nice is that I am the kind of that liaison as well. So I work with the providers at our clinic. And for example, if there are some sleep needs or if our neurologist has, you know, some, some recommendations, she'll talk to me and say, hey, do you think you can add this um, in the healthcare plan on the mm -hmm. IEP. So it's really nice because I, I understand Angelman syndrome and I understand the, the medical needs as well that I'm, you know, I have um, explained to schools, you know, certain medical needs that need to be implemented to support the, the student at school as well. Which I, I love that. Once again, I think it's one of those things that we're so lucky that the ASF has all these resources, especially the whole, you know, the 15Q clinic that Dr. Dewis is running and all those consultations that we have are, are beautiful. So we do have another question. I actually get this question all the time, Stacey. So I'm interested to hear what your response is. I'm reading it. Be. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you do when you ask, when you do, when you want to ask for a one-on-one -on -one and, uh, you, you know, and have someone specifically, com uh, you know, committed to your child, this happens a lot where they'll say, you know, well, we have, a, you know, five or six aides in the class, so that will be good enough. But do you have any advice for this particular question? And Rhonda, yeah. <laughs> I just saw your last part. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I will always defer typically to the parents and what they know about their child. I will say as a past special ed teacher, I um, see the value of 
for example, a student who absolutely needs that one-on-one -on -one support throughout the school day, I see the value of having maybe two to three different people, but it's got to be the same person. It's got to be, you know, Johnny in the morning, maybe Miss Sue in the afternoon during lunch, and then maybe someone else. It's got to be the same person. The challenge of having just the one person is what if that one person is sick? Mm. What if that one person quits in the middle of the year? Then you, you need to do a whole new in-service and training Paris. Like I'm all about like, for example, in your question, the teacher has nine students, they have five Paris. Every single one of those Paris should be and the teacher as well as the specials teachers administration should all be trained on how to support your child throughout the school day just in case you need a plan b or a plan c someone is out two people are out who's going to be with your child i've had families tell me that the school will call them and say so and so is not here today and they don't bring them to school well mm -hmm. that's not an option your kid has to go to school bottom mm -hmm. line not your problem your kid's going to be educated. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely against ever picking up your kid early or keeping your kid home. Your kid has a right to access an education and the school needs to figure it out. So I do believe that the paras, the team, they, everybody should be trained. Um, now, the IEP should absolutely say direct supervision Throughout the school day, the IEP should absolutely say staff trained appropriately, you know, with my child or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I, you know, is another recommendation I'll give families in the beginning of the school year, like maybe when the teachers go back before the students go back, um, if you want to go in and, and share like a 30, 45 minute, you know, your own in service to the team, your own back to school kind of, you know, hey, you know, you haven't seen my child since May. This is the progress we've made throughout the summer. Uh, maybe there's some new staff. I'd like to teach you or talk to you a little bit about Angelman syndrome and my, and my, my child. Um, so I have families that will um, every year, you know, the week before they go back to school, they'll they'll go in and they'll talk informally to uh, the team, which is kind of a nice thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And once again, I think a lot of IEP questions that we tech, you know, typically have are very family oriented. So I want to encourage everyone that if you do have you know specific questions, like we'll I'll put the information in the chat as far as how to reach out to Stacy. But we have another question here too. Um, uh, the, this individual loved the idea of the Google Docs and the daily reports um, from everyone to the team. Um, what sort of things would you recommend them keeping up with? What would I recommend us asking them to keep up with? So I would just say that Google Doc is used as daily communication, right? And so um, whoever is working with your child, you would just like some sort of couple sentences today um johnny worked on you know uh you know some social language with his talker um you know the speech therapist can quickly log in and type out her note on what they worked on with um johnny's device the ot can can quickly jot down um sensory strategies or some daily living skills they worked on um, I mean, it doesn't have to be a huge narrative, but it, ha it just quick little notes, right? And um, the paraprofessional, um, Johnny and I went to PE today and he was having the best time playing catch with two of his friends, you know, things like that. Um, and I just, I think it gives you a good snapshot of the day. And, you know, another thing that I would also request, um, maybe document in your IEP as well, that um, either in the prior written notice or the parent input, I would request um, uh, not just the daily communication, but the daily schedule so that you know at the beginning of the day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, through the end of the day, what, what classes and what therapists, what days he has therapy, um, small groups, what specials he, he has, um, I think it gives you a good foundation of, of what the day will look like. 
So we have my, at least at our school, Jackson comes home with this sheet every single day. And it has like um, the communication, the bathroom, the, you know, the special areas they worked on, the overall behavior, and then just notes. And then on the back, as you can tell, my dog ate it already. Uh, on the back, it is a place actually for us to communicate back to the teacher th for the next day. Like, how did your child sleep? Did, uh, did the student eat well and have a nice evening? What fun things did they do just to help us communicate with our teachers, right, um, as well? And this has been fantastic. I think the hard thing for us is that our expectation and our IEP says you have to do this daily and we'll have we'll have weeks that they'll go by that it won't come home and we'll keep, keep emailing. Like for us, it's important to see, especially with toilet training, if he went to the potty, like in, in working on that, right? Because it's part of our IEP. But we have had to reach out and say, listen, like you have you haven't filled this out. We really, really need you to get back to doing it. But it is even and I love the idea of a Google Doc actually better because I could see that very quickly. Um, but the one thing that we and did it's, it's nice in the middle of the day. Yeah. Because the speech therapist might have work with your student with your child, say at 9 30, and then all of a sudden they quickly jot down their notes. And then all of a sudden at 11 o'clock, you get a little alert. You're like, Ooh, what is he doing? You right. don't have to wait till the end of the day necessarily. Um, and the, and if you do document that this is your expectation and they don't do it, they're out of compliance and that's a problem. Well, and, that's the one thing know, we had to deal with because the, our therapist weren't like, weren't doing it. And that's the biggest thing for me. Like if you're working on speech every day, I want to know what you're doing so I can continue those lessons at home. So we did have to push back on that um, and remind them to do that. And, and, that's, and that's where it's the win-win. It's school, home, home to school partnership. Um, the other thing that's really nice about this communication, um, you know, it's Monday and Johnny didn't sleep well last night and was up in the middle of the night at two in the morning or was at grandma's till, you know, whatever. We just got back from out of town. We were at the lake or whatever. Um, you know, giving them a quick information, like at six, seven in the morning, you're like, oh shoot, let me, let me let them know he's going to be a little tired today yeah. or, you know. Yeah. He might have a cold, but it, it could be just allergies, you know, or whatever. So you're giving them some home to home to school, um, some information um, as well. So they have an idea of what, you know, you know, when he gets into school, what, he, how, you know, why is he, you know, yeah. a little lethargic or, yeah. or whatever. So Well, it helps, it, it has helped narrow down the amount of phone calls I'll get through the day from, from the nurse or even like, especially when he has a bad night sleeping, he tends to be a lot more um, uh, unbalanced with his walking and he falls a lot. So I right. always tell them like he had a bad night sleeping. So you need right. to be very visual on, you know, right. on his walking because we don't want right. him to fall and hurt himself. So, right. yeah. Right. And to me, or, Stacey, you know, these are even... very simple things to ask for, right? Like, and it, it seems very. like a lot of our families actually fight for, something as simple as, as a, a one day, you know, com, uh, daily communication about their child. Yeah, no, it, it really is. And, and, you know, it might be as an example, the Google doc, it might not be something they're, um, they've ever done, or they're maybe they're used to the notebook kind of thing. Um, again, that's just one suggestion. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, I'm not really worried about what they do with other families. This is what your request is. And this mm -hmm. is what um, we're, and, and the other part of that is that communication with all providers, it's that accountability. Mm -hmm. You're giving the school that accountability, um, you know, taking care of and educating your child. Like that's such a big deal. Yeah. Um, you should have high expectations, but again, everything should really be documented in the IEP. Um, the smallest thing that you might think is a small detail doesn't matter. You can document it into the IEP. Yeah. So, and I think the benefit of having some one-on-one -on -one with Stacy too, is I think for me, when I started the IEP journey, I didn't know what to expect or even what to expect out of Jackson. You know what I mean? Like, what can I expect to, what can I ask for and how do we do this? And I know that our IEP meetings have become very routine and very much like, here's a report out, like, and sometimes I don't even know what I should be asking for or what I can ask for. And I think that's something that's, you know, is a struggle for me because we're, I don't have time to go read all the 
all the knowledge out there on you know, navigating the educational system. Yeah. So I think that's why you're such a great asset yeah. in that way. Well, and I, I, I think the bottom line is um, if there's just something new or you feel like, you know, your child's not challenged enough, um, your, your child's not accessing um, more gen ed experiences, then it's something to bring up and have mm -hmm. conversations. Um, we all know that research, you know, that peer models support success mm -hmm. for your child. So, um, so, you know, those are, those are things to, you know, advocate, question, request, um, any other questions? I know I went through those slides a little fast too, but. Um, no, it's all good. We have a small group tonight, but I think a lot yeah. of people will listen to this afterwards and gain a lot of insight. I think the best thing that I can encourage families to do, one is to reach out to Stacy. We do have a lot of great um, back to school resources on our website. So I would encourage people to take a look at that. We do have like an, uh, an IEP um, health checklist that was created by Dr. Lynn Bird, who has worked very close with Dr. Jessica Dewis as well. Um, it's just a great kind of medical summary that is really good for the IEP. I, uh, you know, Stacy brought that up as far as one of the resources that she, she can provide too, because I think it's really important for the people who are watching our kids to understand the different symptoms that, uh, not watching, educating our kids, the some different symptoms to be, you know, prepared for. Um, but I'm, uh, curious, like if you could just leave us with one piece of advice when it comes to wherever we're at in the journey. So, you know, moving yeah. forward, just so everyone under uh, knows yeah. and hears, like we're yeah. going to be doing, we're going to be doing bi-monthly webinars with Stacy and focusing on specific age groups. But like, if you could give an overall piece of advice for this journey, what would that be? And what would that look like? Kind of it 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 um circles back to some of those slides I had um the partnership the parent input um your your expectations what do you want for your child to be successful um what are your goals for your child um, articulate the goals you know you want your child to have a vocational experience in the next ten years you want your child to have peer relationships. You want your child to um, participate in birthday parties. You want the school, I had a conversation with a parent um, yesterday. Um, you, you want the school to help navigate these peer relationships. You want your, this family, her, her daughter's birthday is next month and she really wants to have a birthday party and invite kids in the class. Yeah. Um, wow. Those kinds of things. Um, and, there's so many different transitions. There's the transition from zero and then to three, right? When you get to preschool and then you have the transition into grade school and then the transition to middle school and high school and then 18 to 21. And all those transitions, the one the one piece is that partnership. Mm. And the more you communicate positively with new teams, private therapists, um, connecting private and school therapists, providers, everybody's on the same page, you have the goal, you share your goal with the team. Um, it's, it's the way this, the, your child will be successful. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And it's okay, it's okay to agree to disagree. Um, but that's where discussions and um, effective, meaningful discussions um, need to happen and, and do not hesitate to call for a meeting. Um, and um, with respect uh, to to your team, um, you want to be heard and you also want to listen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I um, think you're amazing, Stacey. I've gotten to spend a lot of time with you. Um, and I'm just, we're so lucky to have you and have your extensive knowledge in this area as we navigate this, you know, these, these different parts of this journey, especially, you know, when it comes to IEPs, I think it's just, sometimes I look at an IEP and I just see Latin, you know, it's just so many words and so many things and it becomes very, very overwhelming. So I encourage everyone that's on the phone uh, or that on the webinar or everyone who's listening after the fact 
make sure you reach out to Stacy. You can contact them, uh, uh, anyone on the Children's Colorado team for a consult, whether it's through, for an IEP consult, an AAC consult, a diet, or a chat with Dr. Dewis. You can reach out to them at Angel Expert Consult, all one word, at childrenscolorado.org. If you email them, share a little information about what you're looking for, they will get you connected. Stacy will also be joining us on many more webinars, and she will also hopefully um, be doing multiple sessions at our family conference in 2024. And so we will be seeing much more of you, Stacy. So thank you so much for thank joining you. us tonight. We thank appreciate you. So you. And thank you for Bye. everyone listening, and we hope you have a good evening. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. You too. Bye.